A very good evening. So we are back again with the second session of FMG Must Know MCQs. So we have done till 41 in the last session. So today is the uh, terminating session and the target for today is to cover as many MCQs as possible in continuation with the series one or with the previous session, right? So we'll try, as I said last time, we'll try to cover as many MCQs as possible to potentiate, to reinforce your short-term memory, right? If the audio visual is working well, if there are no technical glitch, please give me a thumbs up so that we can get started. All right. Okay, thank you. So basically, before we begin, let me introduce you to Iconic Subscription, which the Unacademy offers you. With um, It has Unacademy Plus, which gives you some clinically oriented, integrated sessions and an updated recorded content with notes, which are updated notes 2.0 and a free or an included mentoring session all these are present are available right now at 25 percent off at special prices right and also do not forget the word 25 the alphabet or the numeric number 25 because neat pg all the neat pg subscriptions and neat pg iconic subscriptions and academy is offering you 25 percent off on all neat pg and neat pg iconic subscriptions but please note that it is all valid till 27th july and you can go use the code bhumika for all the added benefits all right so we have a lot of people joining in uh, very welcome everyone so um, the ones who are joining late i'll just briefly tell you that the main aim of this next one and a half hour is to cover as many mcqs as possible to potentiate to reinforce your short-term memory as i said in my previous session right all right so if all is good now i've got so many thumbs up saying everything is working well so let's quickly start without wasting any time further so the question on the screen right now is in dcr lacrimal sac opens into and tell me what is the answer so please note the catch here is in dcr right and also what you have to answer is what is the normal anatomical position so i'm trying to cover as many questions as possible with add-ons that are possible i know time is a glitch but we'll be very quick so all right so i have um, b b a a so there are certain mixed responses there the confusion is between inferior meters and middle meters so let me clear with this when i talk of dcr and when i write normal anatomical position there is a difference so now when i talk of dcr would anybody want to change what is the answer when i talk of dcr the answer is please note when i talk of dcr the answer is middle meters but when i talk of the normal anatomical position the answer is inferior meters so now you get the difference between the two so basically the normal anatomical position of opening of nld opening of nasolacrimal duct is inferior meters but when we do a dcr surgery we open the nasolacrimal duct through the osteotomy into the middle meters is that point clear now now there is no confusion so what is the normal anatomical opening of nasolacrimal duct that is in the inferior meters but in dcr we open the nasolacrimal duct or the lacrimal sac into the middle meters is that so that is the catch point when they write the term dcr now is that confusion clear so now there is no confusion so now if i re-ask you this question in dcr lacrimal sac opens into now quickly tell me what will be your answer so the answer is b 
मिडल में इट इज जस्ट गिव मी थम्स अप इफ दिस पॉइंट इज क्लियर बिकॉज दिस इज अ वेरी कॉमन पॉइंट ऑफ कंफ्यूजन सो जस्ट नोट वॉट इज द क्वेश्चन आस्किंग नॉर्मल पोजिशन और इन डी सी आर इज दैट पॉइंट क्लियर एवरी वन येस नाउ द आंसर इज बी good so all my students do not make this mistake again and i am very confident you would not all right so next we come to this image so you have to identify what you get to see in white arrows what is this tell me what is this what is this yes so if you notice the answer here everything starts with s there is subconjunctival scarring at sulcus subtarsalis and what is this called and i mean yes perfect tanya this is called as alch line and which disease do you find alch line which disease do you find alch line anybody which disease do you find alch line and the second question that my second question is which other disease is associated with this world arts so you have to tell me one is arts line which disease do you get to see arts line and what is the second thing in ophthalmology that we know with arts and which disease do we get it absolutely so when we talk of this image what are we talking of we are talking of trachoma perfect we are talking of trachoma can you name any other disease where we get to know about this world arts which other disease do we get to listen to this world arts any other disease anyone uveitis perfect so that is called as arts triangle so we also know know of arts triangle and what is alts triangle that is the area where you find the kps in acute anterior uveitis it is an inverted triangle where you get to see mutton fat kps right so that is alts triangle so we have alts line alts line is seen in cases of trachoma and alts triangle is seen in cases of acute anterior uveitis where you get to see these mutton fat kps so when we talk of alts line so we have just discussed where do you get to see these alts line alts line now you all know is seen in which disease it is seen in trachoma all right okay so now you have to identify what is this what are you seeing on the screen what is this what is this so you can see these small lesions which are present on the palpebral conjunctiva okay so these are basically the follicles these are the follicles remember the previous session we learned about papillae so papillae giant papillary conjunctivitis in cases of vernal keratoconjunctivitis so papillae is different follicles are different follicles are also called as sago grain appearance right so these are the follicles so follicular conjunctivitis follicular reaction more commonly seen in cases of viral infections so then what is this what is this 
yes cobblestone appearance or pave, pavement stone appearance is what is seen in case of giant papillary conjunctivitis when we talk of vernal keratoconjunctivitis and that too in the papillary form of vernal keratoconjunctivitis but here what we saw was follicles now tell me what is this the one that you see in black so these are the follicles at limbus and what do you call it Horner Tranta spots. So, where do you get to see Horner Tranta spots? Horner Tranta spots are seen in cases of limbal form of vernal keratoconjunctivitis. But what you are seeing here is actually the follicles at limbus. These are the follicles at the limbus. And what are these called? These are called as herbert pits these are called as herbert pits so what you are telling right now is horner tranta spots so when we talk of horner tranta spots how will you identify how are, how are they different from this so what you will have is at the limbus you will have a gelatinous thickening so there is a thicker material which is present at the limbus so the gelatinous thickening is present that is the horner tranta spots but these are the follicles at the limbus which is called as herbert pits so what we just saw Herbert Pitts follicles at the limbus, follicles, arts line are all suggestive of which disease are all suggestive of trachoma. So you should remember these are the diagnostic markers of trachoma. So let's quickly revise what we just saw. We saw arts line, we saw follicles, we saw herbert pits right and the fourth one is the fibrovascular penis so diagnosing any two out of four is important to diagnose trachoma so this you should not forget right so all four three things i repeat there are follicles there is a fibrovascular penis there is arch line and there are herbert pits so any two out of these four once they are positive they are diagnostic of trachoma right and trachoma is a very important disease as far as these exams are concerned all right so next we come to most common ocular manifestation of covid 19 the most common ocular manifestation of covid 19 is is so whenever you have to remember this please remember it can be covid 19 or for that matter any viral infections The most common is B. Absolutely. So the answer is follicular conjunctivitis. So whenever we talk of viral affections, always remember follicular response is more predominant. So follicular conjunctivitis is the most common ocular manifestation of COVID-19. If you want to study more about COVID-19, I have already taken a special INICET special topics which is again a free special class so you, i have discussed wilson's disease and covid 19 in detail there so you can read that all right so next we come to a patient incurred trauma to the eye so a patient incurred trauma to the eye and we anticipate high risk of so so is sympathetic ophthalmitis so the first sign of sympathetic ophthalmitis is which is the first sign of sympathetic ophthalmitis good evening swati you've joined us late we have already gone through some of the questions which you can see it later so uh, okay so it's say uh, there are mixed responses akshat say a satvik says b aman says b all right so again i'm the house is divided mm, well so i am asking you about the first sign this is an important question sympathetic ophthalmitis is a very important topic and when we talk of the first sign please remember the first sign is retrolental flare okay so the first sign is retrolental flare is that clear 
so whenever we talk of sympathetic ophthalmitis what do we talk of whenever we talk of sympathetic ophthalmitis we talk of an exciting eye right then there is a period then there is a latency and then there is a sympathizing eye right so which is the exciting eye exciting eye is the one which gets trauma and the contralateral normal eye is the sympathizing eye and what is the characteristic feature or characteristic finding of sympathetic ophthalmitis that we get to see quickly what is the characteristic fundus finding of sympathetic ophthalmitis we don't have much time to waste so quickly which is the characteristic fundus finding of sympathetic ophthalmitis so we know first sign is retrolental flare first symptom would be photophobia or glare and what is the characteristic fundus finding is is anybody so is dalen fuchs not dudes is dalen fuchs not dudes all right so now you should not forget this so first sign of sympathetic ophthalmitis retrolental flare and then you have an exciting eye there's a latency there's a period and then there is a contralateral normal eye gets involved that is the sympathizing eye and what is the characteristic fundal finding the characteristic fundus finding is the dalen fuchs not yields all right so the most common cause of blindness in india it is a very 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 important question this i mean to say now all these questions would be by the national survey of visual impairment 2015 2019 so tell me what is the most common cause of blindness in india the answer is a perfect so whenever this comes to you please remember it is the most common cause of blindness in india in more than or equal to 50 years of age population but when it talks to uh, most common cause of blindness in children what is the answer in children so here there's a difference when i talk of the most common cause of blindness in india it is talking about adults more than or equal to 50 years the answer is cataract but when i talk of children what is the answer perfect everybody says the answer is vitamin a deficiency and it's absolutely correct or if the option says vitamin a deficiency or it is corneal obesity both of these right so either there is vitamin a deficiency in the option or there is corneal obesity there could be one of these would be in the option out of these two either vitamin a deficiency or corneal obesity and this was again given by as i told you this was given by the national blindness and visual impairment survey 2015 2019 the ones who have attended my advanced course they know that we have discussed about this in detail about this survey and this is a very 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 important survey right so when you talk of the children it is corneal obesity or vitamin a deficiency then we come to this sign which is the sign tell me which sign is this you can see a droplet like appearance here seen on retinoscopy this sign is seen on retinoscopy or i would rather better call it as on retro illumination so not retinoscopy i would call it as retro illumination when you get to see this sign this is yes perfect so this is the charles sign this 
is called as the charlie's sign or oil or oil droplet sign or oil droplet sign so this is called as the charlie's sign or oil droplet sign is that clear so where do you get to see this you get to see this in retroillumination so this oil droplet appearance which you get to see is seen at the base of the cone is seen at the base of the cone so this is called as the charlie's sign or the oil droplet sign so it is not a cataract it's an oil droplet sign and where do you get to see this oil droplet cataract anybody Rishilaj, very good evening. So now tell me, where do you get to see this oil droplet cataract? Anybody travel with Chandan? You've written oil droplet. Nihar Ranjan, Medico has written oil droplet cataract. Which disease do you get to see oil droplet cataract? Tell me now. Which disease do you get to see the oil droplet cataract? No, it's not DM. It's not retinoblastoma. Absolutely right, Satvik. It is galactosemia. So galactosemia gives you an oil droplet appearance or oil droplet cataract so the second sign that is there on your screen now identify which sign is this so there is a torch light here there's a torch light here and you get to see an arrowhead pattern nasally so which sign is this quickly which sign is this this is called as the Rizzuti's sign is called as the Rizzuti sign. Which sign is this? This is called as the Rizzuti sign. Okay, this is called as the Rizzuti sign. So what is Rizzuti sign? Basically, you put in a torch on the temporal side. So you throw the torch at the temporal side and it illuminates the nasal side in a arrowhead pattern this is called as risotti sign this is very easy which sign is this very very easy this is seen in cases of advanced disease this is seen in advanced disease so which sign is this perfect spot on this is the munson sign this is the Munson sign which we get to see in the advanced diseases. And what is this sign? If I enlarge the image, what we get to see is something like this. Which sign is this? Which sign is this? <clears throat> And it is because of deposition of which element? These two questions. Which sign is this? And it is because of deposition of which element? <clears throat> All right, I take that. This is seen in keratoconus. But tell me the name of this sign. This is called as the Fletcher ring. This is called as the Fletcher ring. And this is because of the deposition of iron at the level of the base of the cone. This is called as the Fletcher ring. Can you name any other uh, disease where a similar name as Fletcher is seen? Where you get a similar name as Fletcher. This is not called, that is not exactly the Fletcher ring, but something like this. Any other disease which reminds when I talk of Fletcher ring? Yes, KF ring. But please remember these both are different. When we talk of the KF ring, KF ring is seen in case of Wilson's disease. That is the deposition of copper at the level of the Desmet's membrane. But when I talk of the Fletcher ring, that is seen in cases of keratoconus and that is because of the deposition of iron at the base of the cone. So there is a difference between the two. So now no confusions, Kaser Fletcher ring, which is the KF ring, which is because of the copper deposition is seen in cases of Wilson's disease. Is that clear? So now there should be absolutely no confusion about this. And all these 
findings that we just discussed. So let's quickly revise. What do we get here? We have an oil droplet appearance. So the Charlie is a sign, the Rizzuti sign, where you throw light temporally and there's an arrowhead pattern illumination nasally, the Rizzuti sign. Then you have, when you see inferiorly, there is, in, there is a dip in the in lower lid, the Munson sign seen in advanced diseases and the Fletcher ring are all seen in, as you all have said, in a certain type of corneal ectasia. So now you have two options. There is option A and there is option B. So in which kind of corneal ectasia do you get to see the last four image signs? Tell me, is it A or is it B? So now you all have mentioned keratoconus. I have so many answers saying keratoconus, keratoconus, keratoconus. So which out of the two images is keratoconus? Is it A or is it B? Okay, so Akshat says it is A. Any other opinions? Satvik says it is A. Travel with Chandan says it is A. If A is keratoconus, so what is B? Then what is B? <clears throat> All right, so there's a uniform response for everyone from everyone saying A is keratoconus, and I absolutely agree with this. So, which what is B? Okay, so megalocornea, no, you say it is normal, no. See, if you see the contour of cornea, so I agree it is cone shaped. And what is this? There is a globular ectasia of the cornea. There is a globular ectasia of the cornea. So this is absolutely, this is keratoglobus. This is kerato. Globus. Right? So these are the two ectatic conditions of the cornea, keratoconus and keratoglobus. The answer related, the question, the next question related to this image is which out of the two is present since birth? So which out of the two, A or B, is present since birth? It is A or it is B. The one which is present since birth. Okay. So everyone says it is B, B, B. Absolutely. It is the keratoglobus which is present since birth. Okay. And keratoconus is developed later around puberty and both are progressive ectasias. Both are progressive ectasias of cornea. So keratoconus and keratoglobus. All right. So I would just briefly take a minute to say that if you want to revise your equipment, if you want to revise your instruments, because after the first session, I have got so many DMs asking more about the instruments. You, do you want to discuss more about the OT instruments? So there is again, there is a session on ophthalmic equipment series session one. Session one has been completed and is again there, which is a free special class. So you can quickly Quickly go through all these OT instruments there. It's a free special class which has already been recorded on the Unacademy app. And for the same ophthalmic equipment, I'm undergoing, I'm taking a series on ophthalmic equipments where session one and session two are basically for the 
OT instruments. So session one has been completed and session two is scheduled for July 27, 9.30 p.m. So all the ones who have been DM, who have been texting me to discuss more about the ophthalmic OT instruments or ophthalmic equipments, you can see the session one, which is already av available. It is a one hour session on the Unacademy app. All right. Okay, so we move on to the next one. So what is this? Identify what is this and how do you name it? What is this? Identify. What is this? So basically, when we talk of a lesion like this, how do you identify? The points to identify is, please remember, it is a single infiltrate, right? It is well demarcated. There is superation which is present. There is associated edema. Like this, which is present. Surrounding edema. And then there is a hypopion. It is a corneal ulcer. Well, I would call it as a bacterial corneal ulcer. So this is how you differentiate between bacterial and fungal corneal ulcer. The most common causative organism for bacterial corneal ulcer is, is, which is the most common organism responsible for bacterial corneal ulcer is, Due to contact lens. So when we talk of contact lens related infections, we talk more specifically of acanthamoeba. We talk more specifically of acanthamoeba and acanthamoeba with the question we'll talk about the cysts which are present. It is because of the contact, it is a contact lens related infection because of the homemade saline solutions. But when we talk of this is a more specific to contact lens, but most common infection in soft contact lens users is pseudomonas. But then when we talk of bacterial infections, yes, in bacterial infections, most common organism would be staph aureus. So most common would be staph aureus. But similarly, when I talk of this ulcer, how would you differentiate between the two? So this I told you is a single infiltrate which is well demarcated. There will be superation, there will be associated edema and there would be a hypopion. Whenever we talk of this ulcer, so what is this ulcer? It is a dry looking surface. So what you have is a dry looking surface. which is ill-defined, right, which has feathery margins, right, and it has Wesley's ring and it can also have a Hypopion. So now, how do you differentiate between this ulcer and the bacterial ulcer? So whenever I give you these points, which ulcer am I talking about? Which ulcer am I talking about? A dry looking, ill-defined, feathery margins, Wesley's ring and multiple lesions. And multiple lesions. So these are called as the satellite lesions so when these any of these words are there mentioned in the question so that means absolutely right the question is talking about fungal corneal ulcer the question is talking about the fungal corneal ulcer Okay, and my next question is, what is the difference between the hypopion of bacterial and hypopion of fungal corneal ulcer? 
two important points that you should remember the hypopion of bacterial corneal ulcer is number 1 it is sterile and it is mobile whereas the hypopion of a fungal corneal ulcer is not sterile and it is a fixed hypopion it is a fixed hypopion okay and which is the and when you talk of the fungal corneal ulcer there the, the question will talk a very important history of trauma by either it is a animal tail or by vegetative matter or the occupation being farmer so whenever you have any of these points in the question or talking about one of these things in the question just think the question is talking about fungal corneal ulcer aspergillus fumigatus candida right so this is the fungal corneal ulcers so now there should be no confusion whether the question is talking about fungal or it is talking about bacterial corneal ulcer whenever he is talking about the question is talking about contact lens about cysts which are seen the question is talking about acanthamoeba whenever the question is talking about injury in a farmer injury in a patient with the uh, you know animal tail injury by a vegetative matter the question is talking about a fungal corneal ulcer aspergillus fumigatus candida and so on so there should be no confusion between these two things right and whenever we talk of bacterial we know the hypopion is sterile and it is mobile it is sterile and it is mobile whereas whenever we talk of fungal corneal ulcers please remember the hypopion is not sterile and it is a fixed hypopion is that clear there should be no confusion on these because these are the major important questions which are bound to be asked in the exam so there should be no doubt no query about these is that clear give me a thumbs up i move on to the next one is that clear any query still here just give me a thumbs up if everything is clear till now so then i'll move on to the next one okay so now what do we get to see now what you have on the screen is identify this what is this that you get to see on the screen perfect so what do you get to see on the screen okay treatment for fungal corneal ulcer see because there is shortage of time but i will quickly go through it you have antifungals but steroid is contraindicated in fungal corneal ulcer we do give steroids in bacterial but the steroids are absolutely contraindicated in fungal corneal ulcer you have antifungals we have uh, netamycin which is the drug of choice you have amphotericin b then you have supportive treatment in the form of atropine we have to relax the pain cycloplegic spasm has to be relaxed so that is how you go about a fungal corneal ulcer please remember whenever we talk of a fungal corneal ulcer steroids are a complete no no okay all right so what we get to see here is perfect what we get to see here is absolutely right is a dendritic ulcer is a dendritic ulcer which disease do you get to see these dendritic ulcer which disease do you get to see these dendritic ulcer you get to see dendritic ulcer in a disease which is which is a viral keratitis it is the most common presentation in epithelial keratitis in this disease in recurrent herpetic keratitis perfect so you get to see this in herpes simplex virus in cases of recurrent 
infections. So this is the most common manifestation of epithelial lesion in a recurrent herpetic keratitis. Okay, dendritic ulcer. So what is dendritic ulcer? So this is basically an arborizing pattern. You have an ulcer with dichotomous branching. See, this is a di. So if you see it here, if you see carefully, so there is a dichotomous branching. See, there is a dichotomous branching. So which is the other herpetic, oh sorry, which is the other viral keratitis that is important and which other viral keratitis do you know of and similar to dendritic ulcer what is the lesion that is seen in that keratitis so the other that we know of is herpes zoster virus herpes zoster so two important viral keratitis that you should know is viral keratitis one which is hsv herpetic keratitis the important lesion here is dendritic ulcer and please do not forget that there is loss of corneal sensations so whenever the question is talking about viral infections there will be loss of corneal sensations so one is hsv the other is herpes zoster virus so whenever we talk of herpes zoster virus the important lesions to remember here are pseudodendrites are pseudodendrites so what are pseudodendrites pseudodendrites are the ones which are smaller in the the smaller in size they are more peripheral and they lack terminal bulbs so these are the pseudodendrites so herpes zoster virus the term you have to remember is pseudodendrites but when we talk of herpes simplex virus what we remember is the dendritic ulcer and a second important thing that you have to remember in connection with herpes zoster virus is the hutchinson's sign which is the hutchinson's sign so viral keratitis dendritic ulcer HSV, pseudodendrites are seen in cases of herpes zoster virus, which is called also called as shingles. And the other important thing to remember with herpes zoster is the Hutchinson's sign. So now no confusion. So when you have an arborizing pattern, you have terminal bulbs, that is the dendritic ulcer. The other one is the pseudodendrites, which lack terminal bulbs. Is that clear? So that is herpes zoster virus. Then we come on to the next one. A mother brought her child to the OPD with big blue eyes and complains of watering, photophobia and blepharospasm. What is the probable diagnosis? What is the probable diagnosis? So the ones who have all read with me, who have all um, read or discussed or learned congenital primary congenital glaucoma with me know the correct way to remember the classical clinical triad and do not forget pebble all right so this what the question is talking about is the classical clinical triad so such questions, see, you don't even need options. So this is what I tell you. These are the questions where you save on your time and you save on to your mental energy. So whenever the question talks about such classical signs, such classical symptoms, even if you have not seen the image, you don't need to waste time. You just know the question talks about watering photophobia blepharospasm when we have remembered it by the term pebble. So there's a classical clinical triad of presentation for which disease? So the entire thing comes down to congenital glaucoma perfect there are mixed responses but yes this is a classical clinical triad or what we get here is a classical clinical triad which is seen in cases of congenital glaucoma and to make it more correct i would rather write it as primary congenital glaucoma so it is a straightforward answer big blue eyes which is again a indication of congenital glaucoma with the classical clinical triad simply mentioned here and the diagnosis is primary congenital glaucoma or 
PCG or it is also called as developmental glaucoma. Right? So, this is the classical clinical presentation. Then we come to the right sided visual field loss. In a patient, is indicative of lesion at which location? I have told you so many times about this. The, the visual pathway and its lesions are something which always would be there in the exam. Be it ophthalmology, be it neurology, be it medicine, be it surgery, it would be there in one form or the other. So tell me what is the answer. Right-sided visual field loss. Here the catch point is right-sided visual field loss in a patient is indicative of lesion at which location now tell me okay so the house is again divided between option a and option c so whenever i put such questions in my discussions they seem to be very simple they seem to be very straightforward but there's always a point to learn from them see now look here when i talk of a right-sided visual field effect when i talk of a right-sided visual field effect when i say right-sided visual field effect please note it is bilateral I am not talking of a unilateral disease. So right-sided visual field effect is a bilateral term. So when I talk of right-sided visual field effect, that means in my right eye, it is the temporal and in my left eye, it is the nasal field which is gone. So that is why it is a right-sided visual field effect. For so one, the question the here, the confusion is between A and C. So, will I see a lot of people have, after understanding this question, have changed their answers. So, I would like to discuss the options again here one by one. Let's see. So, when I talk of right optic nerve, it is wrong. Because when I say of a right optic nerve, if my right optic nerve is gone, so there will be a monoocular vision loss. It is not a binocular disease. So, when I talk of a right optic nerve, this would lead to complete ipsilateral complete blindness and this is going to be monoocular but the when i say of right sided visual field effect that means it is involving both the eyes so now you get to know why a is not the correct answer is that clear there are a lot of answers like nirmala travel with chandan uh, ugandhar bobby you have a so now you uh, see why this is not a because it is not talking of one eye it is not talking of a monocular field effect and number two whenever there would be an optic nerve lesion it will talk of the pupil reflex loss okay which has gone direct in one eye and the other so it is an afferent pupillary defect right then we come to optic chiasm what kind of a lesion uh, what kind of a defect would optic chiasm give you Okay, just tell me what kind of lesion would optic chiasm give you? Optic chiasm would give you a bitemporal field defect. Why bitemporal field defect? Because it is both the nasal fibers which that you said would be gone. So it is a bitemporal field effect, craniopharyngioma or pituitary adenoma. Then we come to left optic tract. And please remember, I have always told you that whenever we are dealing with optic tract or lesions beyond, that means towards the brain, it was always going to give you a contralateral homonymous hemianopia. So which includes optic tract, which includes a lateral geniculate nucleus, which includes optic radiations. So it is all going to give you a contralateral homonymous hemianopia and that is the answer. Since it is talking of a right-sided visual field effect, so it has to be the left optic tract. So left optic tract would always give you a contralateral homonymous Hemianopia. So, this lesion will also be seen in the lesions of left optic tract, 
natrile geniculate nucleus or optic radiation right so all these will give you a contralateral homonymous hemianopia is that clear so now no confusions in this and when we talk of the left occipital lobe it is very clear so whenever there is involvement of a posterior cerebral cerebral artery there would be a contralateral homonymous hemianopia but with macular sparing all right so is are the doubts clear now now this should not be wrong again is that clear now any confusion in this so i am still i'm telling you visual field defects is a very 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 important topic i don't know how many questions and how many stars should i put here it's that important a topic is that clear everyone so now no confusions so you know how would optic nerve behave you know how would optic chiasm behave you know how the lesions at optic tract lateral geniculate nucleus and optic radiation behave and the lesions at the tip of the cortex would be like what right is that clear perfect so then we move on to the next one identify the correct combination of the stain used along with the filter so which is the filter that is used and which is the stain that is used it is simple and you have to tell me what is the concentration of the stain that is used so you what you can see here is what you see in the background is a blue light so which out of these filters is a blue filter all right so um, yes most of the people say so see whenever we talk of the blue light we talk of the we talk of the uh cobalt filter so blue light cobalt filter so this is out of option and this is out of option so now we are left with two options one is lysamine green and fluorescein so lysamine green we all know this acha which part suppose we do not know which 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 dye is this so how will you guess so i will tell you what is the art of making a smart guess so whenever we see this image which part of the eye is stained anybody can attempt what is stained here is it cornea is it conjunctiva what is stained so i am just trying to attempt it with you in a manner suppose i do not know what the correct answer is yes perfect so what is stained here is actually the cornea which is stained right so when we are confused between these two options we know that lysamine green is something which is used to stain the conjunctiva so this cannot be the option so automatically the option tends to be fluorescein with cobalt filter so what i mean to tell you is maybe there are certain questions which we do not know what the correct answer is but if at that point of time we panic the mind would stop working so please try and understand you don't have to panic just apply common sense lot of questions help us come to an answer with simple common sense and open mind right so do not panic just apply your mind so even if you did not know which which dye is this this is how you would come to a conclusion so this was the cornea which was being stained so it is fluorescein and what concentration of fluorescein do we use we use a 2% fluorescein to stain which is visualized with cobalt filter and whenever we talk of fluorescein do not forget the mnemonic obg it is an orange colored dye it is a orange colored dye which is irradiated with blue color and which emits green color which emits green color right is that clear all right so moving on to the next one a female with a history of well controlled diabetes well controlled diabetes presented with painless progressive diminution of vision and the following cell lamp findings identify the cataract so whenever this is a question which is just to tell you that there might be a googly at times there might be a googly at times by that time can you tell me what the answer is
all right so basically here the examiner used a very tricky thing to tell you about well controlled diabetes so that well controlled diabetes was just to confuse you towards thinking it to be a diabetic cataract but it is not a diabetic cataract it is a simple case of nuclear sclerosis it, the image was simply a case of immature senile cataract and that too if you see in the center there is nuclear sclerosis so it is what it is nuclear sclerosis so here the term diabetic was just to confuse you so you might have such googly questions which are thrown at you but then again i tell you you have to use your common sense so the answer is simple it is immature senile cataract do not fall in the trap which the examiner has said you are more smart you are smarter you have studied the entire year and you know it right so just be careful if the question is talking about controlled diabetes do not just keep start looking for the answer where is the diabetic cataract or where is the snowflake cataract so diabetic or a snowflake cataract was not in the option it was simply an image of immature senile cataract right so that is what i wanted to teach you through this all right so we we'll come to the next one a uh, patient presented with a golden brown ring around the cornea what is the investigation to be taken so if you see this image so what is the question talking about a golden brown ring so which ring is this that the question is talking about so everybody says the answer is b b b all right you are right the answer is b and what will happen to this b is it increased or is it decreased so there are again there is c and d uh, iron and calcium all right before we come to this confusion just tell me what is the arrow indicating what is the arrow showing what is it so if you know what is it there will be no confusions of between b c and d the arrow is simply showing as the kf ring what is the kf ring it is the kesar plecher ring and which disease do you get to see the kf ring we just discussed it is seen in cases of wilson's disease so which disease do you get to see the kf ring it is seen in cases of wilson's disease or which is called as the hepato lenticular degeneration so this is a disease of copper metabolism this is a disease of copper metabolism and when we talk of the serum ceruloplasmin please remember the serum ceruloplasmin level is reduced it is not increased it is reduced so this is the wilson's disease also called as hepatolenticular degeneration what we get to see is the copper deposition at the level of the desmids membrane it is called as the kf ring and the serum ceruloplasmin levels are reduced so now you identify what you get to see is it a pingicula is it a dermoid is it a regium or is it an arcus senilis what do you get to see on this image tell me <clears throat> is it a pingicula dermoid pterygium or arcus senilis quickly my target is covering lot of mcqs we already through i think one hour is already gone yes we just left with 30 more minutes quickly all right the answer everybody says is b uh, already there's option of d also coming up okay let's see so the correct option here is b and i would rather call it as a limbal dermoid so there is the dermoid at the limbus which is called as limbal dermoid or it is called as choristoma it is a limbal dermoid or a choristoma which might have a hair also in between so that is what is to be identified when it says pingicula or pterygium or arcus senilis let's quickly see so now what is this out of these options what is this once you know you are able to identify the image you are because all of us know almost 
the basic of everything the difference here is what is the clinical application of what we know and that is the problem with identifying the disease so once you know what is this absolutely right this is pterygium so what is pterygium pterygium is an elastotic degeneration of the conjunctiva where you have a fibrovascular band which is growing towards the cornea it arises from the conjunctiva and goes towards the cornea so this is what this is pterygium this is pterygium so here you have a fibrovascular band which is going like this if that is pterygium then what is this i have marked in red circle there is a nodule the classical dd of a nodule near the limbus is this what is that this is classically again described as an elastotic degeneration of the conjunctival tissue which is called as what is this now absolutely so it is a yellowish color lesion it is a yellowish colored yellowish colored elastotic degeneration of subconjunctival tissue and this is called as pingicula right this is called as pingicula so now you know so what we just saw was a limbal dermoid or a corostoma right so that is what is limbal dermoid or a corostoma it is a normal tissue at an abnormal place so it is basically a normal tissue which might have a hair follicle also which is present in many other parts of the body but it is at this time present at an abnormal location which is not the normal location for that tissue right so this is pterygium and this is pingicula then we move on to the next one refraction through what kind of a surface leads to this image first when we discuss about this question tell me what is this image identify this image what is this image what is being shown here so basically what is being shown here is refraction through two principal meridia where there is one focal point here which converges earlier than this one so there are two focal points one there are two focal points one is here and the other is here so what is being shown here pingicula would be a yellowish coloration lesion pinkish color would be more of a pterygium because it has vessels in that all right because of the lipid de deposition because of that the pingicula would be more yellowish in color all right dr nisi yes perfect so what we see here is actually what is mentioned here is the sturm's conoid or it is also called as conoid of sturm so what is conoid of sturm what is conoid of sturm so conoid of sturm is basically the geometric configuration of rays which are going through or which are passing through an astigmatic surface or through a toric surface or through a sphero cylindrical surface so that is called as sturm's conoid right so when you have any which surface would have two principal meridia obviously it would be a toric surface or a sphero cylindrical surface or an astigmatic surface so basically the geometric configuration of rays which are passing through such a meridia which has two principal meridia where one focuses earlier then the other set of rays which focuses later is actually what is called as the sturm's conoid and the difference between these two between these two is actually the sturm's conoid and an important thing to remember here is this point d which is the complete circle which is present sorry not point d it is the point c here the c here is called as the circle of least confusion so this you must remember this is an important structure the sturm's conoid conoid of sturm the next question on the screen is a nerve placed outside the muscle cone 
or the other way to ask this question is the nerve spared during retrobulbar block is quickly tell me what is the answer the nerve that is spared during the retrobulbar block is the anyone okay so you there are again mixed responses uh, c c c and d or the sixth nerve no the answer is the nerve that is spared during the retrobulbar block is the fourth nerve is the fourth nerve and fourth nerve supplies which muscle fourth nerve supplies which muscle tell me fourth nerve supplies which muscle yes so it supplies the superior oblique so this is the nerve which is placed outside the muscle cone now since it is placed outside the muscle cone hence this is the nerve which is spared during the retrobulbar block is that clear so fourth nerve supplies the superior oblique sixth nerve supplies the lateral rectus so it is the fourth nerve or the superior oblique muscle which is spared during the retrobulbar block we have discussed so many times why it is uh, spared how it is spared that it has been discussed in detail during these sessions so no more discussion now all right so fascia of inferior oblique and inferior rectus join to form which ligament tell me so the fascia of inferior oblique and inferior rectus join to form Tell me. So, fascia of inferior oblique and inferior rectus. Inferior oblique and inferior rectus join to form which ligament? Is it capsulopalpebral fascia? Is it Wittnall's ligament, ligament of Lockwood, or the Muller's muscle? I'm so happy. So, uniformly, an answer comes out to be C. The answer is ligament of Lockwood. Absolutely. So inferior oblique and inferior rectus join to form the ligament of Lockwood, which is like a saddle. Absolutely. Identify this test being done here. Which test is this? Identify this image. Which test is this? Quickly, quickly, we're still to cover more questions. Absolutely. And what does this detect? This is the words four dot test. And it identifies what? It identifies suppression. Scoto. Okay, it identifies the suppression scotoma, right? And then these are the findings that we get to see in the word four dot test, and what does this signify? So we have four findings: we have A, we have B, we have C. We have C and we have D. So tell me, so if you see the image, basically there's a uh, red in front of right and green in front of left eye. So if you see the image A, what are we seeing on the screen is one white, two green and one red. So if we see something like A, what does that mean? What does A mean? What does A mean? Yes, so A is basically the orthophoria. It is 
orthophoria or the normal state then what is b which isotoma is b so b basically what you get to see are the two red dots but there is nothing visible in green so which i suppression scotoma is it so what is b so when we talk of b we see that there is no green and green glass was present in the left eye so it is absolutely it is a left eye suppression perfect then we come on to image c so in image c the re red was present in the right eye and there is no red c so which what is image c image c is yes so it is right eye suppression and originally on the screen we had four dots that was two which were green one which was red and one which was white but when you get to see one two three four five dots what does that mean so what is the image d image d is what does d signify what is d anyone d is it is manifest squin because what you get to see here is diplopia okay so this is how you interpret words for dot test right so d is a manifest squint because it is showing you diplopia so this is the interpretation of word four dot test bridal or a leash phenomena is seen in which disease it is seen in brown syndrome stilling tug doing syndrome cpeo or a mobius syndrome i know it is a little difficult one but then yes we are here all here to learn about the new things so where do you get to see the bridal or the leash phenomena the bridal or the leash phenomena classically which is seen in cases of anybody who wants to attempt this one this is interesting okay so we have mixed responses one is d b a the house is completely divided on this question well i know it is going to be an add on to what you know bridal or leash phenomena is classically seen in duane's syndrome it is the duane's syndrome it is the co contraction of medial rectus and lateral rectus when the globe slips so that is the bridal or the leash phenomena which is seen in cases of stilling tug duane syndrome now identify this image which image what does this image show <clears throat> what is the name of this image what is this so i have given a hint in the uh, superiorly written here there is a division classically seen in the midline which is like this so one side is pale the other is reddish and which syndrome is this so this is called as the harlequin syndrome this is called as the harlequin syndrome and which disease do you get to see this you see this in corners syndrome you see this in corners syndrome and we have discussed in detail about this disease in our advanced ophthalmology session right so this is the horner syndrome which where we get to see this harlequin syndrome right so no confusions the ones we have discussed this in detail so harlequin syndrome seen in cases of horner's syndrome so now identify what is seen the image only tells you so what do you get to see when you throw the light when you show torch light there is 
no response in this pupil which is of the larger size so basically what you get to witness is an isochoria right so there is no response to light but when the, you give a near target when you give a near target you see the larger pupil constricts and then it then it we redilates on looking at far so which what is this what is this i have drawn this here there is a light near dissociation so light near dissociation is seen in which kind of a pupil light near dissociation is seen in which kind of pupil it is there is no response to light but the pupil constricts on near and there is a slow tonic redilation on looking at the distance it is it is unilateral condition it is not a gail robertson pupil this is the see the condition is unilateral so this is the ad's tonic pupil this is the ad's tonic pupil it is not a bilateral condition it is a unilateral condition so light near dissociation whenever the term the question talks about light near dissociation this is what we talk of ad's tonic pupil then we come to this question a 58 year old man diagnosed case of POAG which is primary open angle glaucoma approaches for evaluation of the disease which of the following will be the point of concern in his evaluation so what would you evaluate you would see a nasal shifting would you see a bionating sign would you do a ddls scoring or all of the above or all of the above so basically the question is talking about the disc findings optic nerve head findings in poag so this is what the question intends to know from you now tell me the answer tell me what is the answer anybody what is the answer well the answer here is all of the above is all of the above we know whenever we talk of the glaucomatous disc there is nasal shifting of the vessels in advanced stages of glaucomatous nerve head there is a bionating sign so what is bionating sign we all know so once the vessels appear to be broken off that is called as the bionating sign and the ddls is scoring so ddls scoring is the scoring for the glaucomatous disc that is all of the above are the are the points to be noted in a glaucomatous disc is that clear so the answer is d all of the above there is nasal shifting there is bionating sign there is a ddls score even if you do not know what is a ddls score so we we know there is a nasal shifting and we know there is bionating sign so once we know there are two options we have to it has the answer has to be all of the above so that is again a smarter way to solve the questions quickly what are the differentials of this image which is colored halos the differentials for colored halos is the differentials for colored halos is is conjunctivitis acute congestive glaucoma and cataract so if i label them 1 2 and 3 so to differentiate between 2 and 3 
we do this test. So identify this test. What is the name of this test being done here? Which test is being done here? So this is, which test is being done here? This is, Ansley Finchim Stenopic Slit Test. Amsley Fincham stenopic slit test. So when we do this Amsley Fincham stenopic slit test, what we do is we pass a slit through the pupil. Now you have to tell me in which of the two glaucoma or cataract will there will be a break in it. So if you see, will which one would be uniform and where will you find the breaks? This is an Amsley Finch and Stenopic slit test where there would be breaks, actually, would be a cataract. Would be cataract. Is that clear? Because there is a uniform corneal edema and glaucoma, so there would be no breaks seen when we pass the slit in the acute congestive glaucoma. Whereas in cataract, there will be the breaks which are present. So the cataract will have breaks. Whereas no breaks would be seen in cases of glaucoma. And how would you uh, uh, differentiate from conjunctivitis? Once you do a liberal wash, you just remove all the discharge, the colored halos would disappear. Right? So the cataract breaks. In glaucoma, there is no break. In conjunctiva, there is a liberal wash. Quickly coming on to the next, next one. A 28-year-old boy suffered road traffic accident. An ophthalmologist would be careful to evaluate the following associated with trauma. It is phacomorphic glaucoma, angle recession glaucoma, hemolytic glaucoma, or a pigmentary glaucoma. The question is very simple. Which of the following is associated with trauma? Which of the following is associated with trauma? Is it phacomorphic glaucoma, angle recession, hemolytic, or a pigmentary glaucoma? Okay, so most of the people say it is hemolytic, but I always say, again, I told you last time, there would the, when you have such options where there can be more than one options which you feel is correct, what would be a better choice of the two has to be the answer. When we talk of hemolytic glaucoma, this would have been the answer had the option been saying a ghost cell glaucoma. When I talk of hemolytic glaucoma, what kind of a glaucoma am I talking? I'm talking about trauma. So either it is angle recession or is it hemolytic glaucoma? So out of the two, the better option when you have is you are right. Both of these options can be the answer. But the better option here is, the better option here is an angle recession glaucoma. Hemolytic glaucoma or it is called as the ghost cell glaucoma. Right? This would have been a better option if the question would have talked about vitreous hemorrhage. If the question would have talked about vitreous hemorrhage happening. If the question is not talking about vitreous hemorrhage, whole cell glaucoma is basically once there is vitreous hemorrhage, these cells with the time they lose their hemoglobin, they become less pliable, they are taken, eaten by the macrophages which go and block the angle. So they are called as the ghost cell glaucoma. So if the question talks about vitreous hemorrhage in association with trauma, the better answer would be ghost cell glaucoma. But since the question is not talking about vitreous hemorrhage and it is not a multiple choice question, then the better answer would be an angle recession glaucoma. Right? Okay. So now there are missed responses which are saying why not A? See, when you talk of phacomorphic glaucoma, you need to understand what is phacomorphic glaucoma. Phacomorphic glaucoma is when you have morph means shape. So there has to be intumescence. When the question talks about phacomorphic 
morphic and pigmentary glaucoma is seen in cases of young myopic men young myopic men right then we come to this question a, again a similar type so lens induced secondary glaucoma is again an important topic let's see a 60 year old male so i'll try to you know solve the maximum confusions that you have in uh, all these lens induced glaucomas so 60 year old male diagnosed as hyper mature cataract underwent cataract surgery Days later, he developed raised intraocular pressure with corneal edema and whitish collection in AC. The probable diagnosis is. Now you tell me what is the probable diagnosis? Tell me the answer. These are the tricky questions. So see, the catch point here is he already has undergone cataract surgery. Okay, so I'll try to help you here. So now what you all are answering is B. You're answering phacolytic glaucoma because all you have read is hypermature cataract, right? If the question says there is hypermature cataract and the patient is still not operated, that is where you have a phacolytic glaucoma. That is hypermature cataract. This leads to phacolytic glaucoma. But here the question says he has underwent a cataract surgery. So phacolytic glaucoma would have been there if there would have been no cataract surgery. There is a hypermature cataract where the patient has undergone cataract surgery and now he is developing glaucoma so that is because of lens particle glaucoma that is because of lens particle glaucoma right so you get that so it would have had it just talked of a hypermature cataract and glaucoma that is a phacolytic glaucoma so this is how you differentiate so this is a lens particle glaucoma the other hint that came to you was there is corneal edema and there is a whitish collection in AC which is because of that cortical matter which is going into the anterior chamber. So quickly solving what you just saw, if you see the lens in tumescence, if you see the lens in tumescence, you call it as in tumescence, then you call it as phacomorphic glaucoma. You call it as phacomorphic glaucoma. When you see something like this, with when the lens is displaced from its normal position, you call it as phacotopic glaucoma. You call it as phacotopic glaucoma. When the, no, the lens is displaced from its normal anatomical position. But when you have uh, the question talking about a hypermature cataract, but the cataract is still there, that is called as phacolytic or a lens protein glaucoma. And as we just saw, when you have something where the cataract surgery has been done and then you land up with this kind of glaucoma, that is what is called as, that is what is called as phaco, sorry, that is what is called as lens particle glaucoma. When you have the cataract surgery being done and the lens particles are actually deposited on the cortical matter, which is seen as a whitish discoloration in the AC. So I hope this is clear to you. So what is phacomorphic? What is phacotopic? What is lens protein? What is lens particle? Everything. These are the secondary lens induced glaucomas. So this was my small attempt in revising as many questions as we could with explaining as, as concise, as collaborative manner as I could. With all this, I wish you the very best of luck. Again, I would say just maintain your calm, have a good sleep and trust yourself. Trust your training, trust your mind 
and believe in yourself that is very important for you to come out at your own best the problem we land up is we are deficient in sleep and we do not trust ourselves i again i would just say that please do not panic if you do not know a question just apply a bit of your common sense and if you can reach up to at least 50% or two options do attempt that question with that i will just sign off all right if you need the pdf i'll put it on the telegram group which is by the name of dr bhumika i so you find the pdf there you can get that there wishing you all the best have a good sleep revise revise and more revisions reinforcement building it into your reflexes it's what's going to give you and come out on that day right so i'll sign off thank you so much have a good day sorry have a good night and a beautiful sleep wish you all the best good luck